Hello, and welcome to today's Knowledge Equity Network event. Thank you for joining us. My name is Margaret Korosek, and I'm the Dean of Online and Digital Education here at the University of Leeds. I'm delighted to welcome you to this live conversation looking at Knowledge Equity Network in an evolving extended reality or XR landscape. Today, we are broadcasting from the University of Leeds Helix facility. Helix is a collaborative digital learning space, which brings together creativity, innovation, technology, and design, and is an evolving and experimental space, helping us explore opportunities for developing digital learning here at Leeds with a global reach. I'm joined by my guests, Simone Beigendeck, Vice Chancellor and President of the University of Leeds, and Kuz de Baer, XR Consultant, Extended Reality Interaction Solutions, currently visiting Leeds with the University of Pretoria. In today's session, we will begin to look at the ways in which technology can positively impact knowledge equity by providing opportunities for digital learning, collaboration, and training, along with exploring the barriers that might be currently in place when it comes to accessing cutting-edge technologies and broader barriers to knowledge equity. I'd like to start first by introducing Simone Beitendeck. Simone is the Vice Chancellor and President of the University of Leeds and is one of the co-founders of the Knowledge Equity Network. Since joining the University of Leeds in 2020, she has overseen the development of an ambitious new strategy, Universal Values, Global Change, which provides a blueprint for a values-driven university with a focus on global challenges in education, research, and societal impact. Simone. I wonder if you could start us out by telling us the origins of the Knowledge Equity Network and what your ambitions are for this global initiative. Thank you, Margaret, and thank you for hosting me in Helix, which is indeed a really great facility. And thank you, Coos, for joining us. Um, so actually, the University of Pretoria is co-founder with Leeds um, of Ken, so it's really nice that we could be here together this morning. So Ken, the, the idea started quite a few years ago between me and some colleagues in North America. Now, we're thinking about opening up education to the world through use of online uh, technology, but we couldn't quite make it work because we didn't have the infrastructure. I think the technology wasn't really advanced enough at the time. So when I came to Leeds, I thought this is a great opportunity to actually from one visionary university to start this, this idea and see how far we can get. Um, and lots of colleagues were very interested and, and it's expanded from just thinking about how to bring education to the world to thinking about how to make research truly open, how to make societal impact much more equitable. And the Knowledge Equity Network at the moment really is thinking about global challenges first and then how higher education um, can help. So what the Knowledge Equity Network at the moment um, is, it's it's really comprehensive and it's thinking about how universities can be even better networked to uh, make a huge, huge impact on global challenges. Because if there's one type of institution that can do that, it is a university. But in order to do it, we need to work together globally, Global North, Global South, and really everyone um, thinking about how to use our education, how to train the next generation of global citizens, how to use our cutting edge research in a way that's, that's, that's also equitable in terms of the sources of knowledge that we use. So universities in the global north need to learn from colleagues in the global south about their approaches to climate change, to poverty, to health inequalities. So we can really truly um, exchange and, and work together. So it's about open science, open access to education, open um, societal impact, and, and just stopping competition and truly thinking about radical collaboration. And unfortunately, that's not quite as inbuilt as it should be in the DNA of every research intent. Indeed. <laughs> Indeed. Thank you so much for that context. It gives, gives a real foundation of, of the conversation today and, and the ambitions here. I'd like to um, move to Kuz, please. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. I'm really interested first in um, sharing, you know, what is extended reality? We think, what is XR, VR? You know, what's the mix of this? But if you can just scope a little bit of that for us. So XR is the umbrella term for mixed reality, virtual reality, and open reality. So it encapsulates all the reality technologies. So in education, people tend to talk about immersive technologies, immersive education. Um, so I work closely with the Faculty of Health Sciences at the University of Pretoria, 
um, tr attempting to solve problems for them, looking at things that's not necessarily unique to South Africa. It's actually a, a global issue with regards to the scalability of XR technology. I mean, you can build fantastic things, but it's very expensive and it's singular in nature. So you can only, if you think about getting students in it, that's one student at a time. University of Pretoria, the health sciences faculty sits with 400 students. So if you want to use VR, for example, as a training tool, you have to think about scalability. Uh, so some of the proof of concepts, I mean, we don't like calling it applications because they're not commercial. It's experimental. We usually work in research and development closely with uh, subject matter experts. Uh, that we've done before is we've attempted to create uh, a VR experience that teaches people how to execute certain medical techniques. Okay. And I mean, one of them was shown as the, the jaw thrust procedure, which right. is, you know, I would say it's a failure and we should be confident in talking about our failures because um, the technology was very new at that point. So looking at different ways of doing it and finding that limitations, what needs to be taught and what the VR technology can actually teach, the gap between those two things. And then uh, we created a, a kind of experience that shows people how to do malaria prevention. So people can actually go to rural villages and do malaria prevention mm -hmm. uh, in virtual reality. And then the last one is the one that we like the most, which is more broadly out of, as a very broad application, uh, which is um, a web-based platform that allows non-technical staff personnel to create immersive learning content using 360 footage. Uh, to create VR experiences for the students to learn on scenario training in video assessment where you select aspects on the video surfaces. Uh, and what's great about that is it's device agnostic. So it's not, it doesn't require a VR headset specifically. It can use a mobile phone. And a lot of the XR technology is now pushing towards this where you can do it in VR. You can do it with the highest fidelity of devices, but you can also do it on a mobile device and something very simple. Yeah. And that's very important when you talk about scalability. I really appreciate that. And I think we, yeah, we definitely need to touch on that more because, you know, what is accessible? How do we, what, how do we talk about scale, uh, open education, online education? But uh, I'd like to come back to Simone. I mean, your own background in research is in healthcare. How does, how do you see this, you know, in this emerging space and, and what is the potential for the future? I'm really, really excited about the potential for the future. I think it applies to many different areas, not just in healthcare, but also in in many other areas, uh, but let's focus on healthcare for now. And my own background um, is in midwifery, midwifery research. So I researched for many, many years um, the outcomes of pregnancy, development of newborns, basically maternal and infant health. And that's very public health oriented. So it's really not just about the, the birth in the hospital, but it's really about how to make sure that women have the optimal circumstances to be healthy, to bring healthy babies into the world and then also for the babies to grow up healthy. Mm -hmm. And it's so important for the health of entire populations that the start is okay, the first thousand days is okay. Yeah, but there's a huge shortage of trained midwives globally and maternal mortality is pretty much a completely preventable um, occurrence and it's still happening in many countries. And of course, when you think now about the refugee problems, the war in the Middle East, you can just see how this is going to be really bad for pregnant women, for women who have to give birth, for how, how the children, if they survive, how they grow up. So the prevention of problems in the early days is actually pivotal to the health of entire populations. But there are very few, far too few trained midwives, for instance. Yeah. And that's a problem that WHO are seeing, that many governments are recognizing and it's really hard to think about how to how to train enough people at the right um, level of quality with the right skill set, and also how to make sure that once uh, midwives are working together in communities or working solo in communities, they have the opportunity to actually consult with colleagues. So this technology can incredi be incredibly important in training, in upskilling, in collaborating in in the field. Um, and it's it's something that's been lacking so far because it's hard to do the actual training with actual patients, actual women, actual uh, community circumstances. But with AR, VR, we can do so much in the simulation environment and in a hybrid environment where part of the training clearly needs to be with real people. But part of the training can absolutely be with AR, VR 
um, circumstances. And the quality of some of that is going to be superior to when you're watching and observing in a, in a real situation. And of course, the scale, that's really where this becomes very exciting. But one thing I, I would like to make sure is that, or, or say, is that we need to also research the outcomes of these new technologies, because that's often lacking in the people who develop it. They're, they have a technical background and they see the potential, but we need to work with the clinicians, with academics, to make sure the patient outcomes, the patient satisfaction, the doctor satisfaction, the economic outcomes, that they're very well researched and evidence-based. And that's where I also see huge potential for university academic units to work together with the people who understand the technology. Amazing. Um, I think, you know, you've touched on it, you've touched on it before. So I just coming back to you, because in regard to that scalability, accessibility, I love that you mentioned, you know, because there's this concept, you have to have the headset, mm. you know, to, to access this. What, you know, you talked about web-based, you talked about device agnostic. What does that look like, really, um, as we move forward in this space? So, um I like that it's mentioned that it's not just training, but it's also the use of the technology in the field. It it allows you to put the expert in the rural areas exactly. without having to take the expert to the rural areas. There's commercially available software and on augmented reality glasses that allows you to do that type of thing. Um, for me, how this technology would look like on this platform is that you you what we call offloading is so we put the heavy computational work somewhere on a cloud-based system. And these things, the control and the direction is then streamed towards the user and whatever the device they use. And then the device adapts based on what type of device you use. It's like browsing a, a website on your laptop versus browsing a laptop on your phone. It changes that. And the same applies for virtual reality and open reality, where you can go in VR, you can put them in a more immersed environment where with augmented reality, you can give them a window into that world, or you can just take some of the information out of that world and place it into the real world. Yeah. So uh, in half sciences, it's really interesting for me. Um, in mining engineering, training in VR is it's common. It's something that happens extensively in South Africa, but in production, it's not something that's done. In medicine, it's flipped around. VR and AR is used extensively in, in production, in health sciences, I mean, robotics, remote surgery, and all that things, but very little is being used in training. And uh, I think that's why I'm so privileged to work with the Faculty of Health Sciences in this because it's very unique problems and very unique challenges. The last thing I want to add on is I 100% agree with the testing of the application because it's very rare where a, a university or purchase a company developed by a VR or an AR application and they know exactly what they need. That That's very rare because the technology is unique and it's quite complex and it evolves really quickly. So having a proof of concept built having it piloted, deployed, working with the subject matter expert, gathering data, showing this intervention works on this scale and it looks like it can scale and then pulling it further rather than spending millions and millions of rands and pounds and euros to get a solution that you're not sure is going to work. It's very important to do that testing and working closely with the researchers. And yeah. as a recovering academic, I feel like I have a unique insight into that space as All well. Right. Excellent. A recovering academic. Yes. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> um, so I just wanted to go back um, to one of the uh, principles of Ken, and uh, I'll just quote it in, at the moment as well in relation to higher education. Um, there was uh, one of the principles is investing in human, technical, and digital infrastructure that is needed to make open higher education a success. So there's the key words in there about that human. There's an element about open you know, what, is, what does open really mean? How do we enable that to happen? But if we can maybe explore that a little bit. Um, yeah, thank you for quoting that. And, and maybe I'm too optimistic, but I think the technology will work. I mean, you can contradict me. No, it just is your specialty. Yeah. But it's much more important that we have the collaborative culture. And that's, I think, a much harder battle. Because as I said earlier, universities are still unfortunately very used to being competitive and there's that this whole system that we've all helped build up and that we now sometimes complain about but we still believe in it of rankings of competition with each other and the openness of ken um, really is in in conflict with that at times where we need to be generous and we need to not think about ourselves but we need to think about what together we can do for the world 
to the way I see this, I, I think that AR and VR and remote um, uh, clinical work through the technologies that we now have and online teaching, those are the, the engines that can drive these developments. But if we don't have the willingness on the side of universities to actually do this together and starting with that generosity instead of the question, what's in it for me? Mm -hmm. It's going to be really hard to deploy it at a scale and at the level um, that it, it can be deployed to make a huge difference. So for me, it feels like we need to find a synergy between a, a growing group of universities, of individuals, of funders, and um, even headhunting firms who understand the research culture needs to change. The openness of education is really important. And the people understand how the technology can power that. And if we bring that together, I truly think it can be absolutely um, yeah, world changing in terms of filling the pipeline with the workforce we need. And, and I think in health, it's very obvious why we had it. Mm. But it's the same in expertise around climate change and agriculture and, and combating poverty and inequality. There's so many types of profession mm. that really need to be trained and where especially countries that aren't as rich as the UK is and other Northern European countries they need, they need to work together with more rich universities to fill that pipeline of people who can change their, their environment. So the culture, the willingness to be generous and to be radically collaborative, I think that's a much tougher nut to crack than the development of the technology. No. But I think we can make it interesting. We can make it work. We can show people who are willing to work mm. together very quickly and very quite relatively easily mm. what can happen, what magic can happen if they work together and then mm. we use all the, the technology that's developing so fast because it's really changing almost on a daily basis. Yeah. Um, I'd like to come to you, but I just also want to mention to the online audience that are live with us now, put your questions in the chat and we'll, we'll be taking those uh, here shortly as well. Um, but if we could return to you in regard to um, the open component, I'm really also interested in your context within South Africa. Yeah. What does that look like there? You know, are there examples that we can learn from? Yeah. So with Ken, I really like the idea of the global north and the global south sharing. And it's not a one-way street. It is a two-way street. We, yes, we have unique problems, but for us to solve the unique problems because of our unique circumstances, will that some of those problems do exist here as well. Yeah. And transferring that solutions to somewhere else is of to to the north makes a lot of sense. Um when when we develop something, we don't build commercial like I said, we don't build commercial applications. We we kind of fiddle around with new things and putting things together. My the, the guy who builds all my applications calls himself a mechanic, not an engineer, because he just puts things together. And um the the important part of this is not to reinvent the wheel every time. And and I understand there's large industries behind this where you need to make money and it's all about the money. But in academic context and in solving world problems, it is important to exchange. So that funding going into an R and D and the partnership with technology groups and universities is extremely important. The the um, the work I could do in the last two years with working with the Faculty of Health Sciences is not something that you can do when you have your own media house or development company building this type of application okay. because the university just goes keep trying throw science at the wall see what sticks and we just keep going yeah. and i think that that is very important because we need to find where the 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 technology can work because it doesn't work everywhere and we don't know the answers to everything and it's it's i have this two-pronged approach get people excited about xr and then after that start to manage their expectations and say listen there's not a solution for everything and the only way we'll know if it solves a problem is to actually test it. Yeah. And that's working closely with academics. Yeah, maybe if I can add, Margaret, what I believe my experience is with putting technology in front of, of delicious practitioners, academics, is that they'll often see ways of applying it that you and me haven't thought about. And that's where it gets exciting when you start talking to people who actually work in the field and you say, this is the technology that we've developed. They'll, they'll see things and they'll say, well, if you can add this little thing, then we can actually use it in different ways. And that for me is the most exciting to, and that's also then mm. create something that's truly useful and that we can really 
like, I mean, no, has, has an effect. Can I add something on that? So the University of Pretoria Faculty of Health Sciences created this space inside of the library that we are filling with VR and AR technology purely for the purpose of students and staff to play with the technology. It's not a learning space. There is no academic applications on these devices because it's exactly about that. The only way staff and academics will see how this will change their or influence their context is if they understand what the technology can do. So we keep inviting people to come and meditate in VR or play some games. And we had a staff, the librarians book sessions from seven in the morning until 7.30 to come and sit and meditate in their office chairs in the space. We call it the XOR toy box because it's a place where people play with the technology. Yeah. So exposure to the technology is also super important. I love that. And in fact, that's part of the, the ethos here at, mm. at Helix in the space where we are right now is just that exposure. Mm. You know, here's here's something that you can explore, touch, you know, experience. That experiential learning is a, a core element. But it's also about building the capacity, you know, capacity in understanding what is possible, the capacity in uh, designing experiences in this space. You know, so there is a bit of a mix of... Mm. Uh, building overall capacity, awareness, experience to enable these things to happen. Mm -hmm. And I think also at the University of Leeds, we have an ambition to grow our online uh, provision. Digital education is core to uh, the student experience here. And in some ways, you know, how do we start to embed that within the general student experience on in any given program? And how do we look at, you know, how is that possible? But we look internal, but then external. Where are those components uh, available more broadly, you know, where are those open resources beyond? And so this is that fine balance, it seems, how we design for a student experience with a very specific ambition in mind or outcome in mind, but what element uh, from that design process is open and how do we enable that to happen? And I think I, I do feel that that's still, a, um, you know, a, a, <laughs> a bit of a boundary where we need to find, you know, that sweet spot where we can enable that to happen. But I, I, mean, I welcome any thoughts on that one, because that is seems to be one of the big challenges. Yeah, and I, I like what you said earlier, that a lot of the the online um, innovation has started being used more after the education, more in practice, and now we're seeing that it's that we're thinking about how to use it in education. Yes. So indeed, so we're working with the Global Health Education Group which as the name indicates, works on health education. So we're, we're using technology to to scale and to increase the quality of clinical placements and the curriculum for medical students. But that technology too, when you expose clinicians to it, they'll see that they can also use it in, in upskilling and in all kinds of other mm -hmm. um, circumstances. So this particular tool en enables students to look into a clinical practice without, you know, 30 having to be in one GP room. And they can actually listen to heartbeats and look in the inner ear and technology is improving every day in ways that I couldn't when I was a medical mm -hmm. student. So the trailing the clinician, I had no idea what they were doing. But when I was talking about the technology with a colleague who is a professor of midwifery mm -hmm. study, she realized that it could also easily be used for midwives who work in really remote areas on their own and who may be facing very difficult situations for to basically call a colleague in a hospital somewhere else, now thousands of miles away, bring to look into their, their <laughs> own wisdom and give them advice on how to deal with a particularly difficult birth or a cesarean section or whatever it is. And, and it's that kind of huge um, development that I really love where people can start seeing what they can do with it. And how do you enable that? And how do you find the funding for it? And how do you make sure it's still evidence-based and it helps patients and clinicians? But that's all the kind of stuff that academics love. Yeah. And, and the little bit of my academic that remains also. Yes, yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Excellent. We do have a, an audience question, if I can uh, share this one, please. So thank you very much for those uh, sending in questions. Um, what I've got first is, what are the barriers to accessing the technology and resources which will enable this transformation to occur, occur worldwide. How can we build the infrastructure or make the connections to give XR the impact we would like it on knowledge equity? It's kind of loaded, <laughs> a loaded question. 
So we're talking about, you know, um, the technology itself, the resources, uh, as well as, you know, that infrastructure, the supporting, you know, much broader infrastructure. Any thoughts on that one? I think, like I've mentioned before, the relationship between technology companies and universities. Technology companies can solve the problems with technology, but to understand the problem to the right extent, they need to work closely with the experts and with the people within the university. And obviously those companies are money driven. It's a very specific skill to develop these applications. It's very sought after. So to have kind of the financial support to do research and development, R&D, instead of commercial development, but doing R&D, because then that uh, solution would be within the academic institution. And that will, uh, with the Ken agreement, exactly. kind of allow it to flow through other people as well, yeah. and that'll make it accessible. Um, the accessibility of the technology itself, I mean, obviously it's very difficult to find the new, latest and greatest in South Africa, but we wait a bit and we get it or we import it. I mean, I had the, the privilege to come here and immediately buy it at Curry's, um, but it, it'll get there and it'll get to South Africa. And then it's, it is expensive because of, because of the gap in South Africa and the income gap in South Africa. But if you think about a, a headset like the MetaQuest headset 2 and 3, it's the same price as a mid-range mobile phone. And there is so much you can do on that device, and it's such a high-fidelity device. So already with that, if you think, if students, we, we require students to have mobile phones, in the future you can very simply just say, listen, the university will, instead of providing you with a tablet, provide you with a headset. You know, if you, if you, if you want to think about that type of solution, connectivity, power, those are unique challenges as well, not just to South Africa, but everywhere else. Luckily, these things are all built as mobile devices. So you'll just have to go asynchronous with your data uh, and make sure everything can run natively on the headset. Their offloading doesn't solve the problem anymore. So many things, it just comes together. But it's problems we're excited to solve. Yeah. So I think that's, that's, the, that's the value to it. Well said. Yeah, I agree. I think the technology, again, is, is not really the issue here. Um, because it's 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 getting so much cheaper to uh, almost on a daily basis. And if you see what we can do now with mobiles, for in the past you needed a whole big laptop and, and even Wi-Fi accessibility is improving all the time. So I don't think the technology is the limiting factor. I think we do need funding on quite a bit of it too to make sure that we can research it, we can make sure that everything we're implementing is evidence-based, that we're having the right patient outcomes and, and the right. And we also make sure that we know what it does economically, because I'm pretty sure it's cheaper and it's a higher quality if we do this at scale than many of the ways we now train me. But we need to evidence that. So that I think the combination of the tech and the academic yes. environment, that, that is something that, that is unique and that's where we really can uh, make huge steps in having a real impact on people's health and lives. Mm-hmm. But we need funding for that. So whether it's donor funding or formal funding in terms of ERC grants or I'm really pleased that Britain was back in in Horizon um, and working together also with colleagues in at other universities to look at different sources of funding. So for me, that's the biggest challenge at the moment. Where do we find the money? And having small bits, small pots is not helpful. We really need quite a bit more than that to do this at the scale and mm. quality that it can be. But yeah. I'm pretty sure it's going to change so much. And in the end, it's going to save a lot of money too compared to how we now teach and train. So, um, yeah, I, I mean, these are all great points. So I so really appreciate that uh, those perspectives. I have an interesting question from Yelena from Australia. So lovely that to see a broader audience that we have here. Um, Yelena is saying that she's worked alongside Indigenous uh, individuals in regional South Australia for over 21 years. Um, Technical infrastructure, affordability and access are ongoing barriers. Um, You know, what is the experience here or where are we aiming for marginalized communities? How do we uh, how do we touch on marginalized communities who may not have kind of some of the foundational access points of of uh, of Wi-Fi or, or devices even? Yeah. Um, regardless of cost, you know, so how are we uh, addressing marginalized communities? 
and any thoughts on building this community or capacity? You want me to start? Sure. Yeah, I think that's actually core to Ken, because mm -hmm. part of our declaration that we ask universities to sign also is about different sources of knowledge. So it's not just how to access these communities, but it's also how to make sure that their voices are being heard and they are involved in defining the questions they want to see answers to in defining the problems that they want to see solved. So it's really about participation. And this technology can actually, if, if, you, if you do it well, it doesn't have to be difficult to mm -hmm. use. And what you could do is you can bring practitioners into the communities with lots of students or others watching instead of you know, stall having to be there. But you can also use this, these devices to bring experts into the communities, work with the communities, and especially when the distances are huge and it's very difficult to bring lots of practitioners to these remote communities, mm -hmm. you can basically create an, an environment where people can actually meet each other without having to do the traveling or spending days getting there. So it's, it's especially, I think, a, a way to open up indigenous, com indigenous communities and making sure that we remove some of these ingrained inequalities and we can start, in this case, improving their health outcomes. But it, it can, again, it can apply to anything. Yeah. Agriculture, food production, combating climate change, you name it. But the voices of the indigenous and more remote communities and underserved populations, that's exactly what we want to aim for with Ken. And and one, one of the things that you mentioned there, Simone, was uh, about knowledge itself, you know, and there's something about ways of knowing, yeah. which may be different in, in these communities. You know, there are different ways of knowing of that are that are not the Western version yeah. of, of knowledge. Yeah. Um, and so there's something quite interesting in that space as far as recognizing different knowledge sources or, or yeah. uh, foundations. Yeah. So I, I really appreciate that, uh, uh, highlighting that, yeah. When, when designing these types of solutions, uh, again, very important to work with the people that's actually working there, but co-designing with the people that will actually be using this technology solutions is very important. And I mean, as academics, we tend to think, no, we, we understand the problem and we can solve the problem, but you don't have all the perspectives. You don't understand the people's context. So, um, I mean, just f from a technology company perspective, you, you don't necessarily understand what the application needs to do. Yes, you'll receive a brief, you'll receive a specification, but is that exactly right for where you want to use it? And that's why the research approach, yeah. like iterating over the problem and going, this thing will actually work really well. And I, I want to bring up an example because I work closely with the mining engineering department as well at the University of Pretoria mm -hmm. in the mining industry. Obviously, there's large language barrier gaps. It's very rural. So they have unique problems that expertise and learning from that I'm pulling into health sciences because sometimes the mining problem and the health science problem is exactly the same. So we just use the same solution there. If you design an application, instead of trying to localize it to a certain language, how about using gestures? How about using, because the technology isn't just a audio visual solution, it's immersive in nature. So if you use the immersive nature of the technology, it can potentially solve a lot of these barriers. Yeah. Amazing. Please, <laughs> awareness and understanding. Indeed, you, you may think you have the solution, but it may not be the right solution. But that's also where it gets exciting because it's not just about tech. It's also about using social sciences and humanities colleagues to, to help us and, and indeed finding ways to getting the voices and the, the cultural background and the needs of the populations that have so far been underserved. For me, that's actually the most exciting yeah. part of what this technology can bring. Yeah, it's it's actually fascinating how much um, you know. Really, we're talking about culture acknowledgement of other cultures. You know, those ways of knowing, and not necessarily taking those things for granted as we design these experiences. I think there's something quite powerful in that space. Um, you know, as we explore uh, what is possible, but also that scale and a applicability of 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 some of this. Um, I do have another question here. Um, and it's in, in regard to Ken as well. So, you know, really how 
looking at how we can enable this collaborative working. How do we bring together the right elements in the higher education sector? We've touched on some of this already, but um, how else might this impact digital learning beyond health sector? Um, certainly, we've we've touched a lot on health sector, which is is key and core. Um, but you've already mentioned so many other applications. But is uh, you know, how can we look at uh, digital learning more broadly and and use leveraging Ken and those who sign up and um, you know, our signatories for Ken. Yeah. yeah, for me, Ken is a very powerful network of like-minded institutions and individuals, people who share all the, the concepts that we've been discussing this morning. And and once you find each other, you'll figure out how to work together and how to use technology to further those much higher goals. And it's already happening that some Ken partners like University of Pretoria and Leeds I'm not thinking of co-creating all kinds of online material and thinking about how to use the technologies in Pretoria and Leeds and beyond Pretoria, beyond Leeds, and learn from each other. So for me, it's really about bringing people together who so far have been thinking about these issues in relative isolation and wanting to do it differently, but you can't do it alone. If there's any anything anywhere you need a network for, it's... The Ken philosophy, because it is about collaboration. Yes. So I, I don't think we can answer that brilliant yeah. question very, quite easily, but it's more like it will happen. So let's, <laughs> let's keep growing and let's keep finding ways of actually making it happen. Yeah, there's not really an end point. <laughs> it's just keep keep going and uh, keep exploring. What what you're doing. Exactly. Mm. That, that's very important. Yeah. Just keep inspiring each other. Yeah, we, yeah. we keep getting in trouble at the university when we build something and it's really cool. We put uh, put it on YouTube and tell people about it and then immediately the Python oh, fellows yeah. tell us we go on Python it. <laughs> We're not interested in Python doing it. We want people to use it. Exactly. Yeah. So probably get stoned by a lot of people about it, but... Mm. The more you do, the more you solve problems in interesting ways, the more you share it, exactly. the more other people can build on top of you. Yeah. So I've got another question. Um, and uh, at what point should the industry move uh, from the use of VR to AR? What does that mean? <laughs> interesting question. Uh, and it's something that we're working with uh, quite a lot. Again, in, in health sciences, it's both aspects, both tools can work really well. But there is no moving from the one technology to the other technology. Okay. It's the best tool for the job. Uh, mining engineering has a very clear cut example. So I like to use that one. It's underground, you can't put a VR headset on a miner because that will obstruct their vision. It's problematic. So you can put an AR device. You can put something that gives them some extra information, some overlay information whilst they still see their environment. So in mining, uh, me and my colleague I work with there is it's very clear cut. It's VR for training, AR for production. But that's now. It's not the be and the end all. Um, in health sciences, it's VR can work really well for training because you can create a complete virtual environment. But AR will also work really well for training because if you overlay extra information over a dummy or something like that, you can have extra information there which will help you learn easy, easier. So there is no transition from the one to the other. It is understanding which one works in which context the best. I love it. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, let's see. What else do we have here? Um, there's a lot. <laughs> hmm. uh, let's see. So we're talking about uh, advancing equity, ef equity effectively, meaning... Um, identifying global needs and facilitating a leveling out, many differences between this community, specifically in IT capabilities and internet access, um, the importance of openness, openness principles to be successful, um, and looking at, uh, yeah, the openness. I know that we've often talked a lot about, you know, repositories for open, open educational resources, repositories, and building, building this. We're, we're, pushing those boundaries of, of open, um, not specific to a repository, not specific to kind of contributing, but it's it's almost looking out more than kind of putting something in, it's going out. But again, I mean, we've touched on open already, but what else is there for that open, uh, open resourcing, I think? 
it's a hard one because we've already touched on it. Um, and it's a, you know, because it's, it's that contribution, it's mm. access, it's generation and it's funding you've touched on quite and a bit. It's technical issues, right? So we've developed something at University of Pretoria. We want to share it with University of Leeds. There needs to be a technical person at University of Leeds. Mm. If, if all the other structures agree and you can say, listen, we can give you this, you know, with all the bureaucracy that goes with that, then we need to hand that over to a technical person on this side. And the responsibility and the contribution then shifts to a, a dual partnership, both people contributing to the same platform. Now, software development allows you to do that quite easily, but that the, the larger structures need to support it. Because otherwise, it's something that I spend a lot of time and a lot of money in building and then just giving away. So that's why I was saying in the beginning, the partnerships between technology companies and universities and everything that comes with that is very important because then that problem is not really a problem because there's agreement. So when, when one solution is built, it's spread and the people that built the solution is taken care of and the people that's contributing to the solution is acknowledged for their contribution. It's how the academic thing works. If you do something and somebody references your work or build on top of your work, you reference that person. In academia, that's the only currency you need. Yeah. But in technology, we'll have to figure out how we're yeah. we going to do that. Yeah, so maybe maybe I can add it. I completely agree with you. And I think one good thing about academic uh, work, uh, which, which is not competitive at all, is the collaboration between research groups because academics are very used to working with colleagues across the world. Yeah. And if there's if there's funding for what they want to do together, um, they'll go. And if they, if they see how they can co-publish and how it can make their academic work more exciting by working with colleagues in very different universities with different populations and different questions, this is not going to be any problem pushing them into that space. So then we can figure out the IP and how to deal with the yeah. technology and the, the finances around that. I think that's really secondary. Mm. So f for me, again, the collaboration between the tech companies and the technological expertise and the academics with their the big questions and, and finding the evidence for everything we're using, mm. that's where it becomes really interesting. So I think we, we just need to keep working towards building these big research collaborations using the technology for very clear outcomes and seeing whether it works and doing that more and more globally. So again, I think the funding at the moment is the biggest issue. Where do we find enough money to make this happen? And should it be donor funding or foundations or formal uh, research councils? Probably a bit of a combination of all of them. But I don't think in terms of venture capitalists, that's that's not really where I would look mm. because this is not about making money with yes. technology. I agree. It really is about changing yeah. the world. Yes. And of course, we need money to do it, but it, the money making is not our goal. Right. That's right. Yeah. So we're coming towards the end. We've got a few minutes left. We've covered a lot <laughs> from the technology, the infrastructure, that radical collaboration and the enablers, the funding. Um just passing uh, first to Simone and then to Kuz for any final comments, anything else that you would like to share that we haven't covered, anything else to add to this conversation? Start with you. Yeah, it's hard to know what to say. I, I, I still, well, I'll start with, I'll finish where I started. I think we're at a really interesting point in time where if we get this right mm -hmm. and if we work together towards those bigger goals, we can, we can achieve amazing things. And I sometimes have, have jokingly and exciting meetings with colleagues who are like-minded and where we think about what we can do next with one step closer to global peace. And I really feel that, that when we do this right, we will be one step closer to global peace. Not that we'll ever reach it probably, at least not in my lifetime. But it feels like we really can do amazing things if we focus on the goals first instead of um, yeah, the technology and the tech and working with people like Coast and yeah. others who see what we can achieve is just so exciting. Yeah. So I, I think this is really something amazing. What I really appreciate is just keeping that ambition high. It keeps our frequency on a on a you know a level that is just keeping the ambition high mm -hmm. and the aspiration. So really appreciate that. Final comments. So for me, it's. 
to say that XR is not just a fad. It is it is the next evolution of technology, and it is something that is going to become commonplace. And everybody's working really hard for like some market penetration and uh, the ubiquitous nature of the technology and all that stuff. But it is this is the future. The technology is the future, and for universities to get behind it and start using it and to expose students to it, that you don't get exposed to this the first time in an arcade, but in your class or in the library at your I love university. It. So good. And that, that that's the important thing for me. And the for for tech guys working with university to not be afraid of failing. I mean, you build something, you test it, it doesn't work, you go back, you make a change, you try again. Where in with when it comes to capital, venture capital and that type of stuff, you can't afford to make those mistakes. You you just make that work. Yeah. Where in Academia, it's beautiful. You just it's about learning. Keep poking it with a stick yeah, until it works. Yeah, yeah definitely this, uh, you know, the opportunity to fail and, and being okay with that, you know, that that uh, being able to just try something and acknowledge that maybe it hasn't worked, but be able to pivot. Mm. What does it mean? But certainly about building that capacity, uh, offering exposure, um, you know, having a play, having a go <laughs> at different things. I think once you do experience something uh, in the in the virtual reality extended, you you it kind of lands. You're like, oh, oh. Yeah. And then you see in your own context how that might apply. And then you have the conversation with a designer or a technician and you start to play around. And that's, that is definitely a sweet spot. So thank you very much, uh, both of you. Um, we're just going to wrap up here. So I really want to thank you both uh, for joining us today, um, Simone and for Kuz to join us here um, for this conversation. Really appreciate uh, joining. And also to our live audience, thank you very much for joining us and for all of the questions. Really appreciate the engagement with the audience as well. Um, and we probably didn't get around to answering all the questions, so the Ken team will respond to those questions as well and uh, follow up. Um, we're looking forward as well to welcoming you to another event in the future. We've got 10 events coming up. Our next event is on Tuesday, the 14th of November, and focuses on reward and recognition, building a culture of collaborative leadership. That one will be a good one in a couple of weeks' time. Um, I'd like to invite you to visit our website, www.knowledgeequitynetwork.org, to read and sign up for the declaration and become part of this network. Uh, and you can sign up also for the uh, next online events as well. We look forward to welcoming you again soon. It's been an absolute pleasure. And thank you for joining us here in Helix and for uh, the engagement today. Thank you very much.